Hello, and welcome to your most obedient and humble servant. This is a women's history podcast where we feature 18th and early 19th century women's letters that don't get as much attention as we think they should. I'm your host, Katherine Garrett. Uh, today, I am thrilled to be joined by Anna Burks. She is a research librarian at the Jefferson Library, a editor of the Thomas Jefferson Encyclopedia, and a frequent debunker of spurious Thomas Jefferson quotations. You may have seen Anna on the news talking about various bad Thomas Jefferson quotes. So hi, Anna. Hi, how are you? Good. So could you tell me a little bit about what you do as a research librarian at the Jefferson Library? Yeah, well, I do a little bit of everything um, because it's a small library. There's only three librarians. So I do mostly sort of public facing things. So I answer reference questions and those come from members of the public and also um, Monticello staff. Sometimes I help them out with whatever they're working on. I buy books for the library, which is okay. really important. Um, I also do some book repair, which is my new sort of thing that I have a skill that I've been trying to develop. Oh, awesome. Um, what else? I, I do work on the encyclopedia, um, and I also uh, do anything that needs done with the library portion of the Monticello website. That covers the main things, Thanks. and then there's all those sort of, you know, other duties as assigned kind of stuff, clearing <laughs> copier jams, although not so many these days. <laughs> So what, what got you started? I remember for a while you were sort of the go-to person to prove whether a quote actually came from Thomas Jefferson um, or whether it was a spurious quote. Um, do you remember like how that how you got that reputation and what got you interested in that? Well, I've always been very interested in telling people that they're wrong. <laughs> so I think that was <laughs> the aspect of my personality that I'm not proud of. <laughs> it's not my most attractive trait. <laughs> that that sort of question really appealed to that aspect of my personality. And so I got to put it to sort of a, a acceptable use there. Right. <laughs> Correcting the record. <laughs> Channeling that energy in a, in a productive way. Um, <laughs> it, it, we had, it, so when I started, I had one predecessor um, as the, the research librarian at the, the library, and he had developed kind of a list of um, common spurious Jefferson quotes. And so I just kind of built on that and expanded it. And so from that list, I expanded it into like each quote got its own article. And I really sort of got into researching, okay, so if Jefferson didn't write this, where did it come from? Right. And of course, you can do some pretty impressive looking things with Google Books. So so yeah, I, I really did get interested in um, you know, where did these quotes come from and how did they sort of get attached to Jefferson and, and sort of why too? I think that that right. always kind of interested me, like why, why do people think that Jefferson said this? Um, and what, what about that sort of appeals to people's preconceptions about Jefferson maybe, or, um, their own political ideas or leanings, um, right. there's, there's a lot going on and it's just, I, it's, um, it's a really interesting thing to me. Um, and so more broadly, I'm also just interested in ideas that people have about Jefferson that are not necessarily wrong per se, although those, those are also interesting, <laughs> uh, but also just, um, trending into more kind of like folklore. Right. Um, and there are some stories about Jefferson that conform to like folklore. Uh, I'm not quite sure the exact terminology, but there are um, sort of folklore tale types that are all um, codified and numbered. And I can't remember off the top of my head who, who did all that work, but you can actually um, point to a specific um, folklore tale type. Yeah. Um, so there are stories, there are a lot of stories about regular people uh, meeting Jefferson just as he's sort of out and about riding on his horse or whatever. Yeah. Um, and those are just like perfect examples of the folklore type of this motif of the king among the common people. Huh. Um, and it's, I, I sort of researched it a bit and, and, and found that there was this whole codification and that these tales about Jefferson are really the same 
stories that have been told about the same types of people for thousands of years, um, which is just really, really interesting. Yeah, that's super cool. Um, for the letter this week, um, I asked Anna, because she works pretty closely with some of the folks from the Jefferson Retirement Series, and I know that she's been very close with uh, a lot of the family letters, uh, if there was anything that she wanted to discuss. And so we've come up with an Ellen Wales Randolph Coolidge letter to her mother, Martha Jefferson Randolph. Uh, and I'll, I'll go ahead and set up the context a little bit for this one. So we've done an Ellen letter before, so you're familiar if you, my longtime listeners will be familiar with Ellen Wales Randolph Coolidge uh, as one of Thomas Jefferson's granddaughters. She's sometimes described as Jefferson's favorite granddaughter. Uh, at the time she's writing this letter, she's 29 years old. Uh, she had married Joseph Coolidge, who was 27 years old at this time. I didn't know before doing the research for this that Ellen was actually older than her husband. Um, <gasps> a scandal. <laughs> uh, it's just so unusual. Usually it's like 17-year-olds marrying a 45-year-old. So this is almost refreshing. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, they're fairly close in age. It's not, yeah. you know, but still, yeah, I, I had noted that too. They had just gotten married six months earlier at Monticello, uh, and she had moved with him to Boston shortly after that. Uh, so can you tell me a little bit about, do you, do you know much about Joseph Coolidge? Um, well, <laughs> this is my problem being uh, someone who answers reference questions all the time. I only know about what people have asked me about. Gotcha. So <laughs> I do know, for example, that Joseph Coolidge uh, is related to Calvin Coolidge. Oh! <laughs> so that's a fun fact for everyone to put in their back pocket. Huh. Yeah, I, I realized as I was doing research for this that I just, I knew Joseph Coolidge as a name, knew he was from Boston. That was about it. Uh, so I did a little bit of research into if I could find anything more about him. And I just like moments before recording this, I found a footnote about him in uh, a article about American merchants in the China opium trade. Mm. Uh, yeah. And this is like back when you could just write. I love I love footnotes because sometimes you just have like little interesting gems of information in there. So this footnote described him. They said he was a very attractive, socially brilliant young man. He had apprenticed with Robert Gould Shaw and married as once again, we get that favorite granddaughter of Thomas Jefferson. Ellen's always described as the favorite. Uh, his very considerable talents were seriously compromised, however, by a personality defect. And that's it, period. What? I don't, I don't know what his personality what defect is. <laughs> but so he oh has some gosh. personality. Oh my gosh, what a cliffhanger. <laughs> and then they said, eventually he alienated everybody. He oh, split gosh. Russell & Co. in 1839 to form Augustine Hurd & Company, but he encountered virtually the same problems with his new firm. And even Hurd ultimately had to admit his error in admitting Joseph Coolidge to partnership. So I don't know what his personality defect was, but it was apparently breaking up these mercantile companies. Well, now we know. <laughs> now we know something. <laughs> I, I, I remember, uh, I think it was my colleague Andrina um, telling me about uh, during that time period after Jefferson had passed away and they were sort of trying to auction off most of the contents of Monticello. Uh, Joseph Coolidge was kind of writing to Nicholas Trist, who was more kind of like on the ground in Virginia. And the Coolidge's, of course, are up in Boston. And Coolidge is writing these very kind of like, you know, do this, do that. Make sure you do this. And don't forget that, you know, like kind of <laughs> <laughs> sort of backseat driving from from Boston in a way that uh, apparently Nicholas was sort of long suffering. Um, so I, I sort of had that that glimpse um maybe that's his personality defect he was bossy yeah. maybe, he's, <laughs> maybe he's bossy <laughs> yeah. um, I, see uh, i don't know if that would be seen as a personality defect in a man in 19th century in New a merchant England, company though. i feel yeah, like that would be I, good yeah so i i i don't know <laughs> uh, all right okay so i got a little bit sidetracked there context of the letter this letter was written from boston uh november 20th 1825 about six months after she and Joseph got married. So Ellen had a longer single girlhood than a lot of women at her time. Uh, she was sort of a, a belle and flirtatious and going to all these balls for a very long time. But that has now suddenly come to an end. And you can get a little bit of a melancholy vibe in this letter about that. And this letter is also written very shortly after all of her belongings. So when Ellen moved up to Boston, um, almost all of her sort of things that she had packed with her to bring with her were going to be sent by ship. 
and it was in the ship called the Brig Washington, and the ship actually sank, and she lost almost everything that she had intended to bring with her from Monticello. So she had purposefully packed things that had like a sentimental attachment to Monticello, and a lot of them were lost. So this Mm -hmm. is something that, as a tour guide, we talk about this uh, in our tours, because it's just one of those sort of, you you feel for Ellen having lost all these things. But so this letter is written right after that's happened, and she's found out about it. So she's still sort of adjusting. She's lived in Virginia for a very long time. She's very close with her family, this huge family. And now all of a sudden she's in a different state with completely different people uh, and separated from her family who she was very close with. So it's an interesting, it's a different Ellen from some of the earlier, younger Ellen letters that we've been encountering. Thomas Jefferson is 82 years old. He's still alive in 1825. uh, And the family is in a huge amount of debt at this point. Yes. Anything anything I left out important that you wanted to add there, Anna? No, I, I think you got it all. All right. So I'm going to read the letter. And this is another long letter. Um, so we're going to break it up sort of at various points and discuss it as we go along. Ellen Wales Randolph Coolidge to Martha Jefferson Randolph. Boston, November 20th, 1825. Mary's letter of November 10th arrived only yesterday, my dearest mother, when I had been nearly a fortnight without hearing from home, except through a letter to Mr. Hilliard from Grandpapa, which, letting me know all was well, prevented me the hysterical feelings this unusual silence was likely to have produced. I am grieved to the heart to perceive the tone of melancholy which pervades all I receive from the girls, and my fears sometimes lead me to imagine that they do not tell me the worst, that the affairs of the family are declining more rapidly than ever. When I look around these nabobs, one year of whose incomes taken separately would restore tranquility to my dearest friends and brighten the hopes of so many loved ones, I sigh over the unequal distribution of the gifts of fortune until the recollection that these very persons have made themselves what they are and risen superior to all the obstacles which poverty and obscurity and original insignificance could accumulate in their paths has in turn given birth to the hope that the younger branches of my family may one day achieve the fortunes to which they were born, although it has been snatched from them. For those who from sex or age are condemned to a passive endurance of whatever may happen, I cannot help hoping that better, brighter days are in store. I believe there is something in the very air of New England which produces or increases a religious tendency in the mind, for I feel a stronger confidence in the doctrine of an immediate providence and greater trust in its interference with the affairs of men than, I think, I used to feel. Perhaps you will infer from this that I am satisfied with and grateful for my own lot. Indeed, I am far from being dissatisfied with it. I have much to make me happy in the character and conduct of my husband, and the affection which subsists between us, in the kindness of his friends, and the comforts of my situation, which, although it might be more splendid, could not, perhaps, for that, be happier than it is at present. If things only continue as they are, and no change for the worse should take place, I should think it unreasonable to ask for more than I have, except on the point of an easier intercourse with my family." Still, such is the influence of my particular dispositions and habits that I cannot feel secure for myself even when I am hoping most for my friends, and that superstitious dread of a sort of planetary influence still infects the stream of my thoughts. Although I have power to prevent it from disturbing the current and rendering it turbid with its own dark and heavy flow. Joseph is naturally sanguine, and I strive constantly to elevate my own spirit to the height of his, rather than make any attempt to depress his to mine, except where I think it necessary to check his too liberal temper and aid him to correct his expensive tastes and habits. So to break there for a minute, maybe his too liberal temper and expensive tastes. That <laughs> maybe that's his character flaw. <laughs> that's his personality defect. Who knows? I don't now know. Now I'm looking for it everywhere. <laughs> So um, what's your take of this first part of the letter? Yeah, I I think there's probably a lot going on there. You know, she's trying to sort of put on a brave face for her mother. And she she does go on a bit, doesn't she? I I think that was all like one sentence, maybe. (laughs) That whole first paragraph. (laughs) Lots of ampersands. Um, I think, you know, you, you... you often ask what what is relatable about these letters. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think that everyone can relate to um, being far from home. And even though it's still the same country, um, even so my sister lives in Massachusetts, um, near Boston. And even today, it just feels like a very different place than Virginia. Mm -hmm. I think that uh, her line about 
there's something in the very air of New England which produces or increases a religious tendency in the mind is an interesting sort of cultural yeah. note. I don't know if it's more the people than the air, <laughs> possibly, but sure. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, and it's it's hard to know exactly what, what she's referring to there. But right. um, and and then the the planetary influences thing was was an interesting comment, and I did uh, do a little light googling on that point as well. And there there was you know hundreds of years before she was alive, it was fashionable I think in medicine to attribute conditions to the movement of the planets. But that sort of surprises me if that's what she's referring to. Right, because that seems like you know by Jefferson's day, and and TJ would have had the sort of latest medical theories at his disposal in his libraries. I think that would have been relatively out of fashion, and certainly not not thought of as very scientific. But maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. Maybe maybe something about it appealed to her, or maybe I'm totally wrong about what she's referring to. Right. I that I wasn't sure about that either. I wasn't sure if she was talking about like astrology. Definitely seems like it it's um what we would now call pseudoscience. <laughs> <laughs> um that's interesting that she threw that in there. Yeah. And and so I, it made me wonder if she was actually just like cuz she says it's something about her own nature that even though things seem fine, she's just not happy that it just it just sounds to me sort of like relatable sort of she's going through a depression. Like I don't, obviously mm -hmm. back then there wouldn't be any sort of clinical depression uh, understanding or treatment or anything like that, but she's definitely down and yeah. she says it's something about her personality uh, makes her a bit more pessimistic about things, which yeah. I haven't seen in her other letters where she's always being very cheery. So this is a, a different side of Ellen than I've seen. Mm -hmm. And she does mention the money. I think her little bit about just seeing all these nabobs with all of their money that if they could just give one year of their income to her family, it would help them out so much. It's so funny because she's, she's so close to saying something like that there isn't, you know, a meritocracy, right? She's like really close. And then she just in a one long sentence totally backtracks and is like, yeah, oh, but she they backs did. away from it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> they yeah. pulled themselves Whoa. up by their bootstraps. <laughs> uh, you know, as if they, every single one of them, uh, had been born, you know, in a barnyard somewhere and didn't have any, <laughs> which I'm sure is totally true in every single case. Absolutely. You know? <laughs> yeah. And, uh, uh, and her, her little bit, I do think, um, which she says those from sex or age are condemned to a passive endurance of whatever may happen is interesting for her to say that because mm. it, because as a woman, she can't pull herself up by her bootstraps and somebody like Ellen wouldn't be somebody that would say that needs to change but she is saying this it's kind of a tragic situation to find yourself in so i think mm. she's sort of re reaching out to her mom a little bit about that yeah well and i'm sort of thinking about this in the context of knowing sort of what what happens later and that you know they're all her family is already struggling financially you mentioned it at this point yeah. in time but you know it gets worse and um ellen's kind of branch of the family they're the ones who later in the 19th century um, they're the ones with the money, you know, mm. and, and all the, the, her, uh, a lot of the descendants of her, her other siblings, you know, stayed in the South and did not fare well. Um, mm. And so that it, it, sometimes people ask me, how, how did all of these Jefferson documents end up at Massachusetts Historical Society? And that's why, because, you know, right. the Ellen, Ellen Colge's descendants, they were the ones who had money and means and they discovered a lot of documents that their southern cousins had you know i think literally moldering away in attics and stuff and they just didn't have the the money um or the wherewithal to care for them properly and i'm not sure if they purchased them or if they just uh, worked out an arrangement where they took them huh. um but that that's how they they got a lot of stuff um which they then uh, deposited it at the Massachusetts Historical Society. But there, there is this kind of divergence of um, circum financial circumstances in the family. And so that's it, interesting that sort of Ellen is musing on this in, in her letter here. Um, all right, so I'm going to go into the next section of the letter. 
I do not like to say anything of the loss of the brig Washington, with all my little treasure of long-cherished relics, memorials of past times and past pleasures, connected in my imagination with my best affections and fondest recollections from childhood up through youth and womanhood, to the period where every woman may be said to begin life anew, and to be... blank... ected... recollected? Who knows? with former times chiefly through the medium of those affections and recollections. I had almost a series of small tokens of the different scenes through which I have passed from my earliest memory of events to the era of my marriage, tokens having the power to conjure up thoughts which, to use one of Moore's comparisons, were to those scenes what the auto of Rose is to the flower, a perpetual memento of the sweets and the loveliness that have ceased to exist under any other form. But fortunately for me, the memory of the past lives in the heart, independent of all outward signs, and I shall not think the less of times gone by, and the affections and enjoyment of those times for having lost the little records, which, like the knots in a Peruvian quipos, were mentally connected with the most interesting feelings and events of my life. I do just want to say, she says, I do not like to say anything. <laughs> and then she does. <laughs> <laughs> she writes that whole thing. Um, but anyway, she doesn't like to say anything. I'm very glad that the D on V and the Periclete, at least, are saved. The girls must keep the first as long as it can be at all useful. I do not require it at all and will only call it mine for the sake of Auld Lang Syne. The little drawing I wish to have by the first perfectly safe opportunity. Was the crayon head done by Aaron Vale lost with the rest? Mary speaks, among other things, of that infamous letter written by Brower. I have rarely felt such indignation as upon the sight of it, but I am very glad to have it in my power to contradict his falsehoods at least among my immediate acquaintance. They have, however, I suspect, gone the circle of the Union and have been read by all who read the newspapers at all. So, that's there's a lot going on in these sections. She's yeah. talking about a lot. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I, I've just noticed that she, in both of these paragraphs now, she starts out saying, complaining about something, and then working up saying, but I don't like to complain. Or <laughs> she's, she's like, she really wants to, uh, to unload on her mother, but she's trying to like rein it in a little bit and put a little Band-Aid on it. Yes. <laughs> um, Everything's terrible, but I'm fine. I'm up. But don't worry. Don't worry. <laughs> yeah. There's a, a lot of interesting. And I, I also find her, um, miss, her little misspellings kind of. Adorable. <laughs> Memento. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Memento. Um, and, uh, well, I was I was impressed that she brought up knots in a Peruvian quipos, which... Yes. Uh, that's a uh, really interesting... I mean, how many other, you know, young women in her, of her social class in her time period would know what a quipu was? Right. Uh, so what, what, what is a quipu, if you will elucidate? It's a record keeping device yes. um, that was used by the Incas, I believe. Yeah, it's 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 a it's a recording it device involves, with it knots. Involves knots. Yes, yeah. Um, but I, I I did a quick check and and uh, there were at least half a dozen books in uh, her grandfather's library that may have that were about either Peru specifically or more generally South America that she could have learned about Peruvian quipus in. But I just find that a really interesting and amazing reference, which yeah. really just speaks to how much um, Thomas Jefferson's library was not just his. Right. Um, it really influenced his um, children and grandchildren too. I, I did want to quick mention the, she mentions the crayon head drawn by Aaron Vale. So in the last letter that I covered in a podcast that about Ellen was shortly after she had met the Vales, and she's very mean about them. Oh. Um, <laughs> but, <Rams. laughs> uh, but here she is. But then everybody always describes them as good friends. So I do think that this is hmm. some more evidence that they eventually, after a bad first impression, she changed her mind and became friends with them. And uh, she was really asking after the crayon head. Um, now, the little bit at the end where she talks about the infamous letter written by Broer, I was very excited oh, to boy. do. Oh, <laughs> boy. This is very juicy. <laughs> the whole uh, Bro could... Broer episode. Yeah. This is something that I used to try to talk about on tours, but it never really worked. And it's something that would try whenever I try to tell this as an anecdote, nobody believes that it happened. But Thomas really? Jefferson, yeah, nobody believes this one. And I'm like, no, this is very well documented. But he, he had a life mask sort of taken for a bust 
very late in life Mm -hmm. and something went wrong (laughs) and he oh boy did it (laughs) (laughs) uh so brewer was the artist who made this life mask of thomas jefferson and i have i'm just gonna read some takes on what happened because uh thomas jefferson wrote very shortly after the whole event took place. He said, I was taken in by Brewer. He said his operation would be of about 20 minutes and less unpleasant than Udon's method. I submitted, therefore, without inquiry, but it was a bold experiment on his part on the health of an octogenary, worn down by sickness as well as age. Successive coats of thin grout plastered on the naked head and kept there an hour would have been a severe trial of a young and hale person. He suffered the plaster also to get so dry that separation became difficult and even dangerous. He was obliged to use freely the mallet and chisel to break it into pieces and get off a piece at the time. These thumps of the mallet would have been sensible almost to a loggerhead. The family became alarmed, and he confused, till I was quite exhausted, and there became a real danger that the ears would separate from the head sooner than the plaster. I now bid adieu forever to busts and even portraits. (laughs) So that's Thomas Jefferson in October 1825 writing to James Madison about this event. Oh, boy, can you imagine the scene? (laughs) Poor, poor, I I kind of feel bad for him, actually. You know, he's he's sort of gotten in over his head, it sounds like. (laughs) You're malleting at Thomas Jefferson. <laughs> He's head. like getting more and more frantic. It's not working. It's not going well. And the, fo- the family is pounding on the door. Like, what are you doing to grandpapa? <laughs> God, the poor guy. Oh, yes, and it sounds like TJ was not having a fun time either. Uh, no. It does sound quite painful. You know? And he's sort of down, he's making little jokes about it, but he's clearly mad. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I love that line about the bold experiment on his part. On the health of an octogenary, <laughs> a bold experiment. That was funny, and so and so this happens. Um, Brewer publishes in the newspapers a letter saying that everything had been a massive success, specifically about <laughs> Thomas Jefferson. It was a massive success, but you may hear something because, uh, and here the quote starts. Just as I was removing the material from the head and shoulders of the venerable patriot, four ladies came into the room, accompanied by a gentleman, and troubled me with their exclamations and surmises, and thereby retarded my progress considerably. The good old man stood like a hero, and you know it is no trifle, yet could not altogether overcome the sensation of feeling faint. Finding the ladies did not retire at my request, I determined that they should leave me alone to my own operations and spoke rather peremptorily. And all was as it should be a perfect model. (laughs) I should do wrong to myself, did I not say, that owing to the intrusion of the ladies, I had to pull the old gentleman's ears a little. (laughs) So Brewer blames all of this on the granddaughters immediately. uh, That's so interesting how he described this whole episode. He pulled the old man's ears a little, whereas Jefferson Just a little, though. (laughs) He almost tore them off. (laughs) (laughs) And so so just to imagine being one of Thomas Jefferson's granddaughters and reading this, uh, particularly... Oh, man. (laughs) Oh! (laughs) Uh, Mary ended it. So this is one of Ellen's sisters, Mary. She was furious. And so she wrote in her letter that he should have dared to jest upon the subject of the sufferings that he made Grandpapa undergo was bad enough, without the additional falsehood that we did not treat his attempt with the indignation it deserved. He would also make it appear that our alarm and Grandpapa's danger was the consequence and not the cause of our entering the room when we did, that we were quite unconscious of what was going on, till the noise made by the servants hurrying backwards and forwards for wine and water, etc., first excited our apprehensions, and though I was the first to go in, it was not until I was terrified by hearing the sound of groans as I stood at the door, and Mr. Brower himself was calling out for spirits, when as I entered, another trait of his accuracy is his converting permission to copy a bust into a gift of it. <laughs> Luckily, it has not yet left the house and will not be sent until he is set right in that particular. She's so mad she's not even like finishing her sentences. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I, that's very understandable. <laughs> so, so from Mary's perspective, they heard the s- servants' slaves coming in to get spirits and they're like, what's going on? And she went to see what was going on. Yeah, it sounds and like could, there was a kerfuffle. Yes, and, and could uh, hear Jefferson yeah. struggling. And so then she runs in to help and then... Apparently he shouted at them. Yeah, Sounds like a, quite a scene. <laughs> <laughs> I can just see Ellen going to all these different Boston uh, social events. And anybody mentions that letter and her just correcting the record as soon as she can. 
Um, okay, so there's that section. And then we'll finish up. We've got one more section of the letter. And then the postscript. <laughs> and then the postscript, <laughs> yes. It's a very important postscript for this one. Okay. Winter is coming upon us here. The thermometer yesterday stood at 18 degrees above zero, and today there have been threats of snow. I am having a wadded police and cloak made to protect me from the ill effects of the outward air. Within doors, I am quite comfortable, as our house is perfectly well built and warm. Mrs. Derby called to see me this morning, in spite of the blustering weather, partly, I believe, to inquire after my health, and partly, I suspect, to be the first to give me the news of Mrs. Robert Patterson's marriage with the Marquis of Wellesley, by which she becomes Vice Queen of Ireland, a splendid destiny for a female adventurer. You will smile to hear that Mrs. Ritchie and myself are making something like advances to an intimacy, manuscript mutilated, all our old antipathies. I always did justice to her talents and distinguished manners, but I am beginning to think that my judgment of her character was not so fair. She is assuredly altered much for the better. She is to a certain degree disappointed in the brilliant hopes of her youth, and is improved by the change in her situation from the glowing prospects of bellhood to the sober realities of married life with a husband not so wealthy as was at first believed, and constrained by the nature of his property, West India plantations, to be absent a great deal from home leaving her in a sort of widowhood, the more distressing, as she is really attached to him, and makes a most excellent wife. She is an uncommonly fine woman, and there is something so distingue in the, her air and manners, such a stamp of superiority in all she does and says, that it is impossible not to admire her. I am writing by candlelight, and of course, with great suffering to my eyes. Adieu then, dearest mother, and believe me, with all the deep devoted feeling of which you know me capable, your own grateful, fondly attached daughter, Ellen. Then some postscripts. Love to all my dear ones, from Grandpapa to my darling Septimia and George. Dear children, how often and tenderly I think of them. Do my neighbors never inquire after me? <laughs> I wish to tax each of the girls of writing the occasional receipt for me on a small slip of paper which can be put in a letter. Those I am most in need of are first, soup, two, vermicelli soup, three, coffee, four, muffins, five, a charlotte, six, gingerbread such as Edie makes, seven, rice cakes for breakfast, eight, drop biscuit, and several others which I cannot call to mind. I will send the music paper by the piano. There are two or three pieces which I am very anxious for, particularly Fisher's Minuet and Auld Lang Syne. I hope Virginia is well by this time. I conclude it is one of her old attacks she had had, and I hope the next post will bring me news of her recovery in her own hand. It just occurred to me that she's mentioned Auld Lang Syne twice in this letter. Yes. <laughs> Which is interesting. Just pointing she's out. A little, she's, she's nostalgic in this one, I think. Yeah, I mean, that's appropriately symbolic yeah the the marquis of wellesley whole whole situation i mm -hmm. i i wikipedia that <laughs> that um mrs patterson fascinating if you like if you're into this sort of sort of like royal nobility watching kind of i mean this lady's life was fascinating very fancy people later she becomes lady of the bedchamber to the queen of england <laughs> yeah yeah what a, what a life i wonder if That's she wrote memoirs or something yeah. Uh, so I think it's it's funny that Ellen's talking about the neighbor coming to visit, maybe to see how she was, but mostly to talk about this. <laughs> oh, why wouldn't you? <laughs> totally. <laughs> this would be huge news. <laughs> um, as far as the Mrs. Ritchie for the next section, I don't know. I haven't. I wasn't able to find her. I think it's interesting that Ellen is admitting that she had a bad first impression of somebody and then has then changed her mind. So maybe mm -hmm. that uh, is more evidence of some of the snarkier things she says in other letters yeah. she might later take back uh oh give her credit for yeah basically absolutely. you know being willing to revise her opinion and say so mm -hmm. it's uh, very big of her yeah I, I feel like this description was re really compelling to me of thinking about somebody who's married uh to somebody who's not as wealthy as she mm -hmm. first believed and then that he's gone all the time she's ca calling that a type of widowhood i think is interesting um, maybe she's just so it's more of a case of being sort of magnanimous in her victory sort of <laughs> you know what I'm, because like Ellen is like set as far as <laughs> she knows right now. And this, this poor lady, oh, you know, we all, she, and she didn't like her before. 
<laughs> or she said some nasty things about her. Um, and then this lady, but now it's clear that, you know, she isn't doing so well. So now Ellen can feel superior and be kind of uh, magnanimous. I, that is a compelling take, uh, such a stamp of superiority now that mm-hmm. Ellen's kind of in the superior position. But this postscript was actually what first made you think of this letter. Uh, of yes, this it. is really what I wanted to talk about. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but as always, whenever you look at the letter, there's always more interesting things in there. That sure, you expect, sure. But yes. and, and, you know, Ellen wrote the letter, so we have to talk about Ellen, Ellen of course. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, so so... The reason that I knew about this letter was this reference to Edie, who Mm. is Edith Fawcett, who was the chef at Monticello, basically Jefferson's entire retirement period, so around 1809. And I'm a little fuzzy on when she kind of took over from Peter Hemmings, Mm. um, but 1809 until Jefferson's death. Um, And I just really – Edith Fawcett is someone who I think – just doesn't get nearly as much interest or credit. Um, She was just quietly an amazing chef for however many years that was. Um, She and her, I think, future sister-in-law, Frances Hearn, were sent to Washington in 1802 or three, Hmm. early, early in Jefferson's presidency, I believe, to train under the French chef there, oh. Honoré Julien. Um, so they were trained, not in France, but by a French chef and worked in, in Washington. Um, and then so when, when Jefferson returns to Monticello, um, Edith Fawcett becomes the chef at Monticello. Um, and she does that until 1826. Um, and what I find really interesting is that so she had 10 children with her husband, um, Joseph Fawcett, um, and two of her sons actually had a catering business uh, when they eventually um, gained their freedom and moved to Ohio. And I just find that so interesting that they're kind of, they kind of carried on her. She must, they must have learned. Totally. I mean, we don't know exactly, but we yeah. can only imagine that they must have learned um, some of their skills. Um, yeah. recipes, I'm sure, from from their mother. Um, but so one thing I think is really important to point out that all so we don't have any menus. People are always asking for menus um, from yeah. from Washington and, and Monticello. We don't have menus per se, but we do have a lot of descriptions of food, um, especially by visitors, um, because this you know people who live there every day are not going to be constantly describing the food. It's people who, who are visiting and find it remarkable or they want to tell everyone about their experience visiting right. um, visiting the great man um, and have very little detail about it. So we have a lot of descriptions of food that, that was cooked there. Um, and that's that famous quote about um, half Virginian, half French, in good taste and abundance. Yes. They're, ta- they're talking about Edith Fawcett's cooking. <laughs> so, I mean, I think that's that's a connection that, that – people don't always make and and I just I whenever I get a chance I like to talk about Edith Fawcett because I just think she doesn't get enough attention that's awesome uh and like Ellen specifies here that it's gingerbread such as Edie makes so it's not just any gingerbread it's Edie's gingerbread Um. right and and I do sorry this this was sort of my main point that I forgot to make (laughs) As I do. So we have two slash four recipes uh, attributed to James Hemmings. There are a few descriptions of things that, that Peter Hemmings made, but there are no recipes attributed to Edith Fawcett. And it cannot possibly be true that she, I mean, she right. was cooking for decades. Um, she most assuredly had recipes. This is the only reference that I have found. And that, that's not to say that there couldn't be more. Um, I just mm-hmm. haven't found them. This is the only reference I know of to a specific dish. So when I saw this, I was like, oh my gosh. Um, <laughs> so as far as actually finding this recipe in the family manuscripts, that unfortunately has been elusive. There's a lot of different mm-hmm. sources that it could be. Um, so I, I really don't know if that's Edith Fawcett's gingerbread recipe or not and and the the enclosure to this letter 
or, or the, the response um, to this letter. I don't think we have that either. And so what about this letter do you think is really relatable to a modern audience? That feeling of homesickness, certainly. And also that thing that Ellen is doing where she really wants to complain and tell someone about her problems, but she also doesn't, you know, she's also trying to get, put a good, good face on it. Um, I think that's yes. also very relatable, especially with, uh, you know, a parent that you, that you might be close to where you're like, oh, you know, I, <laughs> but but really, I'm OK. <laughs> OK, yeah. <laughs> I think that's, that's, that's very recognizable to to um, to many people. Well, thank you so much for joining me. Well, thank you. Anna. Thank you for having uh, me. It's been fun. It was a lovely mm-hmm. conversation. Yeah, thank you. Um, and to all of my listeners, uh, I will have the text of the letter as well as show notes from some of these sources that i looked up as always with the um in the show notes of the episode and thank you very much for listening and i am as ever your most obedient and humble servant thank you very much